All right, looks like we have uh, a lot of folks here and more entering, um, but my name is John Beebe um, and I lead the Democratic Engagement Exchange. Uh, and today I have a very simple role. Uh, I get to introduce our new host and welcome Victoria Kukitz, who's uh, joining us today. Uh, Victoria brings a wealth of experience and a deep commitment to engaging communities and building an inclusive democracy in Canada. Um, you know, she is an exceptional person um, who has a, uh, brings with her the kind of uh, empathy and conversation and curiosity that I think is with the best of what we want our community to represent. Um, and it's in this spirit that I get to welcome Victoria today um, at the exchange, our commitment is to building a vibrant and inclusive democracy. And we do that by sharing power and, and our platforms with people who are doing incredible work in their communities. And Victoria is one of those. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to Victoria. Thank you. And let's bring a great welcome to Victoria. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate the warm welcome and also the opportunity. I wanna thank you and everyone at the exchange and to everyone joining us here today. Thanks for coming out and battling Zoom fatigue and just being with all of us for what I think is gonna be a great conversation. So I'm wondering, how are all of you feeling? Well, I know I'm feeling amazing because I get to be your host today. I'm so excited to be here. But also, I'm going to share, I'm a little nervous too, because I want all of you to enjoy the discussion and learn what you came here for. So as John said, my name is Victoria, and some of you may already know me from the democratic engagement work I've done in the past. So if that's the case, hi, it's great to reconnect. And for those of you I'm meeting for the first time, I really look forward to getting to know you. So we're going to have a very important conversation, and it's one that I hope all of you will actively take part in. There's going to be lots of opportunities for us to speak to one another and to pose questions to our guests. But first, I'd love to have all of you introduce yourselves to me and to one another in the chat. So if you want to just use the chat function quickly to share your names and organizations from, then we can all know where everyone's coming from. So we're here to talk about power and about representation. These are concepts that, for me at least, are not the easiest or the most clear. But we have two amazing guests who will help make sense of what can often be difficult ideas to grapple with. I want to ask all of you, do you feel like you know how to recognize, understand, and use power? Let's think about that today as we go along and into the question period at the end. But first, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. Today, we're meeting virtually. You may not be on the same ground as me. I'm here in Toronto, oh, I shouldn't say here, I'm currently in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit Territory. So instead, please join me in acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands we're on today to reflect on those importance of the lands from coast to coast. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and collaborating in the spirit of reconciliation. If I can share a personal anecdote, I'm a first generation Canadian myself. My parents come from Australia, which is another white settler colony, and the formerly colonized India and Trinidad and Tobago. So my commitment to a more equitable future is deeply felt. I also want to echo and empathize with the grief, the outrage, and surprise we've all been feeling at the discovery of the remains of the 215 Indigenous children near Kamloops. These harms haunt our history, and they're recurrent in our present day as well, unfortunately, as we stand in solidarity, solidarity with the Muslim community and mourn the murders of the four members of the Afsal family. We empathize with the immense pain that the lone survivor and his community is in and we denounce these heinous acts of racial violence. And this is happening right after we observed the one year passing since George Floyd's death and Toronto's own Regis Korczynski podcast as well. These things continue, cannot continue to happen. We cannot tolerate racism. We have to remain active and do the work to fulfill democracy's promise of equality, of peace, of respectful public discourse, of shared power and diverse representation. 
So with all of that in mind, I want to share some principles that I would like to bring to the democracy dialogues as a shared commitment to the energy we're co-creating. We endeavor to be inclusive, which as John said, is at the very core of the mission out here at the exchange. Accessible, let's work towards building a vibrant and truly inclusive democracy for everyone and work to remove any barriers to participation. Let's be authentic, let's foster openness, humility and truth. And I wanna support and along with the team support all of you in doing the same. And finally, sustainable. So let's also you know, proceed with all those principles in mind. With that in mind and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Delina Cesar Chavan, who was the first black woman elected as the member of parliament for Wiki and author of Can You Hear Me Now? The book I have right in front of me and I endeavored to match with my, my blouse today because I loved it so much and I was so inspired by it. And also Velma Morgan, an educator and also the chair of Operation Black Vote Canada. They will help us share stories, strategies and insights with all of us today. Welcome Selena and Velma. Thank you so much for having us, thank you. So how are you doing? <laughs> That's a big question, <laughs> but you know, I want to ask, how are you doing and, and what are you bringing with you uh, kind of emotionally here today? Velma, do you want to go first? <laughs> I'm doing okay. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Well, um, you know, let's dig into the conversation at hand and let's look at how we start to define power and representation. So Selena, your book, Can You Hear Me Now? is a terrific account of how you harness political power to an entry into Canada's greatest halls of power and, and the decision-making tables. But then you experienced its disciplinary power to try to silence, isolate you, and make you feel very unwelcome. So my first question for you is, how did you learn about power? And can you tell us a, a story about, you know, when you experienced it at different times in your life or a particularly salient example of when you either wielded it or, or felt it? Um, so thank you. And I do want to want to thank the organizers, everybody involved in putting together this forum. I think it's really important to have this conversation. And I think today is an interesting day to talk about power and how that could be wielded throughout our political process. Um, I do want to acknowledge that I am um, coming to you from my home in Whitby, which is the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of Schoolock Island, Williams Treaty Territory. And um, it's important uh, to, to recognize that as we talk about power in this conversation and the fact that there is a constant struggle to ensure that we live in a society and communities that are free from racism and oppression, free from hate, but to also acknowledge the work that has been done by our ancestors across Turtle Island and that those that line the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And so when we think about this question of power and you know where it comes from and when did I first start to think about it, power has always been a part of a life of someone who has multiple intersecting identities. We walk into rooms, we know when to smile, we know when not to smile, we know what to dress, how to dress, what not to wear, what not to look like, what not, how to not to furrow our eyebrows so we don't look mad, how to smile pleasantly, how to talk appropriately. We are always in the midst of this constant battle with ourselves when it comes to power. Um, I think uh, for me, uh, and I describe politics as one of the most painfully beautiful experiences I've had, is the understanding how much power we have when we don't sort of, you know, acquiesce to those that perceive that they have power over you, the misogyny that comes with that. And so, um, you know, when I decided that, you know, I was going to be authentic in politics, it was an intentional decision in September of 2017. And at that moment, I, you realize that that power is not defined in its traditional terms for everybody at all the times. Power is what you do when you have that moment to change and to have impact and, um, you know, I think for me, 
when when I think about power in this context, it's always something that ebbs and flows. And um, once you realize how to use it for yourself and your community, I think that that's where we're going to see a lot of change happening. Thanks so much, Lena. I appreciate it. And I think one thing that struck me in the book was times when you wielded power in, in what I think is pretty remarkable ways, like getting Justin Trudeau to show up to you know, some of your events as, as you were campaigning. What levers did you pull to make that happen? Or, or how did the whole you know, engine work to, to bring that about? So, I mean, I don't think I pulled any levers to get Justin Trudeau to come um, during the by-election. Um, the game was a broader general election that um, needed to be won. This was an opportunity to um, have some exposure on the party. I think where I most used power or most used my authenticity um, and the ability to, to advocate was when I was advocating, was when I was amplifying voices of those who are often marginalized in the political process. Um, power is not about you know, only being in front of a TV screen or only being in front of a microphone. Power is understanding just like privilege. Once you understand that you have that power or have that privilege, first you have to recognize that you have it. Once you recognize that you have it, then you need to use it to do good. And if you're not using it to do good, there's absolutely no point in having it at all. So I think for me, it was about using that power, using that privilege that I had as a member of parliament, as someone who's always given a microphone or a microphone to speak into, was to have a different kind of conversation. I have a conversation about mental health, have a conversation about race before 2020, when it was avant-garde to talk about race, to talk about it when you could test your metal and show who you really are, show that you want to have impact, show that you want to make lives for other people better. And using that power and privilege, that's, that's where I used it the most to make sure that those who were who were in need of it the most, got to share it a little bit of the most. Thanks so much, Lena. And you know, that's one thing that I think we all really appreciate it, about the book is really the window into you being as authentic as you were to really, you know, help reduce the stigmas around talking about the effects of, of your work and, and on mental health and all the other things that people who feel marginalized or who are resisting against uh, disciplinary power feel. So I appreciate that. Velma, uh, I'd love to ask you the same question, but I want to ground it more in representation as a modality of power. Can you help us understand uh, why representation is so empowering and how a lack of representation disempowers and excludes certain groups? Thank you. Uh, th I want to thank John and the organizers, you, Victoria, for inviting me. Um, I acknowledge that I'm, on the, I'm hosted on the lands of the Mississauga, of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. I also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuits people on this land. Uh, so our hashtag is representation matter. And I think people think that when we say that, that's all we want. That's not all we want. Representation is basically, um, it's not the ceiling, it's actually the floor. It is the start, right? So we want to see ourselves in, uh, um, in places that we've never seen ourselves before. That's just the start of it. And it's extremely important to, especially to people who've never seen themselves in certain uh, positions or in certain um, in environments. It helps our community, it helps our young people um, to see themselves reflected in, in positions of power, that we are smart, that we are able to make decisions, we are able to make decisions not only for ourselves, but for, for everybody. Um, so it is important to, to have that. But also representation, um, as I said, is a, is a floor. What we also need now is inclusion. So once I'm there, I want to be able to uh, view my opinion based on my lived experiences. And you can't tell me my lived experience is not right or wrong, right? So I want to be the based on my lived experiences because I can help you shape policies that will help people who've had similar experiences to me. So there's representation and then I need the inclusion of my voice and my experience. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. And thank you for helping us 
kind of answer, begin to answer that more global question. And now I want to take it a bit more local and really hear a bit more about the work that Operation Black Boat does. I think like, you know, historically, and also what are some things that uh, you're working on right now? Right. So Operation Black Boat started in 2004. We are a multi-partisan, not-for-profit not organization. And it started because of our queen, Jean Augustine. Uh, when Jean Augustine was, um, um, was an MP, uh, she was a cabinet minister and a new leader came, came and took her out of cabinet. And the black community at that time said, we're not gonna stand for this. We need to figure out how we're gonna rally around her because she's the only uh, cabinet minister that we've, we've had, how we're gonna rally around her. So a group of people in the community created Operation Black Oak Canada to just do that, to encourage more black people to get involved in politics, whether it's in elected office or just civically engaged in, in, in the policy and the, in the politics and to support elected officials um, while they're there. Uh, we didn't have a body that would speak uh, speak up for people. And that's what Operation Black Vote, um, that's how it started. Um, since then, we've done uh, several different initiatives. We have a women's summit that um, every time we have a women's summit, we have Selena there <laughs> speaking at our women's summit. We have the Next Generation um, Black Youth Summit. And our new initiative is the 1834 Fellowship, uh, where we take high potential Black youth um, interested in public policy and put them through a training. And the reason why we created that particular program and myself and Anime Paulus are the architects of that program is because there is a gap in public policy makers. And we didn't want the government to continue to say, we don't have qualified people to fill these gaps. So we're starting the training of, of young people, but also what we found uh, when talking to young people, a lot of them don't even know that these jobs exist right? They need an entry point. So we're giving them the information that's left out from certain parts of our community that they don't understand. You can be a public policymaker in the prime minister's office, in the minister's office, the MP's office, in the bureaucrat, or in community organizations. These jobs do exist, and you've been left out of them simply because you didn't have the information, nor the access, because they're smart, um, and they have the experience to do this type of work. That's wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. And so I want to ask a little bit and maybe just take apart the terms like diversity and inclusion. So obviously we know diversity is important, but does it, does it matter if there's no authentic inclusion or any no authentic forms or ways to, of actually uh, encouraging and maintaining belonging once people are actually in these spaces? Uh, Selena, do you want to go first? Uh, so, so that's the difference between performative and substantive mm -hmm. work, right? Performative uh, means that you have diversity, but you don't want to do anything else. That is the floor. That is the lowest bar that you could set is to say that diversity does anything for you other than um, establish a ubiquitous model. <laughs> like diversity is ubiquitous. Look at the screen. I'm sure if you looked at the 106 people that are in this, in this program right now, it is diverse. Canada is a multicultural country. We are diverse. That is ubiquitous. That is baseline. What you, you need to follow up with is the inclusion. However, you cannot have inclusion if you do not stop to think about whether if you plant the seeds of diversity, which is ubiquitous, you have a lot of them, in a culture that is toxic, you will kill those seeds. They will never have the opportunity to create the roots that are required to make the connections to have inclusion. So in, um, in a political environment, if there isn't that, that appreciation, and Velma touched on it earlier, and I want to reiterate it, that appreciation for identity-related experience, knowledge, and expertise, meaning that myself and someone else have the same education and the same work experience, but I, as someone with a person with multiple intersecting identities, had to navigate our school systems, our healthcare systems, our work systems in a way that I had to overcome challenges and go through barriers in order to reach that exact same spot. That identity related experience, knowledge and expertise is valuable. Now, if you sprinkle my diversity little self into a culture that doesn't appreciate that, then what is the purpose of having diversity? if you don't actually want inclusion. But I won't just stop there because we wanna talk a little bit about power. And 
Inclusion can only get to a point where you have equity or a sense of belonging if those that have power understand how to shift those power relations in order to ensure that those diverse voices around the table are not just there because you just want to have a pretty little picture of a diverse table, but you also want them there because they are able to set the agenda, describe how things are going to work, and make changes that they deem appropriate, and at the same time feel respected and valued, not tokenized, within that environment. So when we talk about DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion, which is a multi-billion dollar industry that has very little impact on black and indigenous people, we really need to be clear about which thing that we're asking for. Because usually we have most organizations, including political ones that talk a good game about diversity, but don't wanna do anything else. They just wanna be diverse. And that is a very low bar to set. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I read somewhere recently that the majority of companies who actually make an online pledge are the ones who typically also show the worst numbers in terms of recruitment, retention, advancement, et cetera. Um, Velma, I'd love to turn to you to get your take on the same question. And uh, also just, I want to add to it as well. You know, what do you think, how do you think most people would answer the question of what a politician looks like and how can we continue to diversify that image? I just wrote that down so I can remember it. So, you know, I, I like Werner Myers. She says diversity is being um, invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. So, you know, I could be at the party and standing at the wall and everyone's having fun and, you know, drinking away. And I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm just there. I'm just there because it, it, it paints a pretty picture, right? Inclusion is action. So I get to, I get to dance. I get to speak up. I get to, as Sunil says, set agenda. You take my ideas um, and not push my ideas aside. You ensure that I am consulted on issues, not only that relates to black females, but issues based on my education, skills and experiences. Because a lot of times we sit at the table and the only time they refer to you is when, okay, so the black community now, what are we gonna do about you guys, right? Mm -hmm. But guess what? You could talk to me about education. I'm a teacher. You could talk to me about other things. You know, Celine is a science is into science. Talk to her about science. Talk about strategic things. Don't refer to us only just put us in a box. So that's you know, uh, in terms of diversity and, and, and inclusion, in terms of what a politician looks like, I think it differs for everybody. Um, folks who come from countries like the Caribbean, they would have a totally different vision of what a politician looks like. Our politicians look like us. When you come here, um, you might still have that vision of what a politician can look like as a person. I, I think a politician looks different from what we actually see. So that's why I do this work because I know that we, we run countries. <laughs> we run countries well, so we can run a G7. You know, we, we could be a cabinet minister in a G7. So my vision of uh, a politician is Selena, it's me, it's you, Victoria, based on my experience. Other people have a very narrow-minded vision of what a politician, based on their racism, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times I think people um, recruit us, we talk about tokenism, they recruit us and people say, oh, we do this there because they're a token. But guess what? You're not going to recruit me if I don't have the experience. You're not going to recruit me if I don't, if I'm not one of the, the smartest of the smart, smartest. You're not going to recruit me if I didn't have to go through so many different barriers to get my education. Right, so I people might think that I'm a token, but guess what? I'm probably more qualified than everybody there because your boss recruited me. So we have to start looking at how where where, where are black people and why they're there and how do they get there? You know, it's not it's not the we're not there because of nepotism because we're somebody's uh, son or or you know we have a name recognition we have a legacy of people. We're there because of our hard work, our education, our skills. That's. That's that's so well said. Sorry, Selena. Did you? Sorry. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gassing her up. That's facts. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's great. So thank you so much for that. Uh, now I want to talk about a little bit uh, more about how we continue to exercise power. So Selena, you know, as we were talking about, your book is such a vivid account of you coming into your own power and also resisting and speaking out against racism and sexism during your political term. So I think 
you know, writing is amongst the most powerful acts of resistance. So how did your party react when the book came out? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Quite frankly, I don't care. <laughs> that's, that's a great answer. So maybe I'll pivot a little bit and then and say, you know, was the book was the book like a catharsis for you? Was it a way for you? Was it a conscious way to kind of instrumentalize your power and share a story so that we could relate to it and be, I don't want to say fearless because what I loved, once something I loved a lot about the book was that you were really honest when around the times that you had felt scared, but you overcame that. So, you know, yeah, I guess those are my question. That's my question. Was it a conscious way of kind of continuing to assert and, and take your power? Was it like, I'm sure the, the, the answer is probably, you know, multidimensional, but I want to really ask about writing as a modality of power. Yeah, so I don't, I, I really don't think that I wrote this book, not that I don't think, I didn't write this book from a position of trying to do anything related to power. I, I, I wrote this book particularly, uh, sorry, power related to myself as an individual, as the I. I wrote this book based on the last sentence or the last paragraph of the book. And I have it here too. This is my copy as if I didn't write it. I have to like have all these little stickies. But I'm just going to read to people what the last uh, paragraph of the book says. To the people of Canada and beyond, your value is not determined by your title and your leadership does not require a title. The power has always belonged to the people. It is time that the people realize their power. It is not enough to hear my voice. We need to hear you too. This book wasn't written so that I could exert any power. This book was written from a place of healing, from a place of really putting myself out there. So one, people could see that as a politician, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into me getting to where I was. But number two, I wanted them to know that people who made mistakes, who were just regular people, could run. Regular moms who didn't know what they were doing with their kids, who, you know, talk about tampons and do all that other stuff. We could run. That's what we could do. The second thing was to say, the third thing actually was to say that every single part of you, the mistakes, the hurts, the guilt, the pain, the everything form back to Velma's original point, that identity related experience, knowledge and expertise that makes us authentically able to run and most qualified to run to represent the people. You know why? Because all of that, that mistakes and hurt and pain doesn't allow us to sympathize with people. I don't sympathize with those that are most marginalized. I actually empathize with them. Mm -hmm. I empathize. I feel them. And when you are when you are charged with the responsibility of representing the people, if you can't feel their pain and feel their hurt, as well as feeling their joys and feeling their, their strengths, then what are you actually doing? So this book was to say, look, use your whole self to find that voice. This is what a politician can look like. This is what a politician can do. All of your secrets that you think are hidden, that they're gonna dig up and find, look, go ahead. I don't care, right? They're there. So, so run. The power yes. in this book was for the people to understand that they have the capacity and the capability to run, even in writings that are quote unquote unwinnable. Yeah, yeah. I just want to watch for that. Oh, sorry, go, I'm gonna go right ahead. Because I think I've read Celia's book twice. Um, and I, and I've, uh, I, I think I've been shadowing her on her little book tour. I don't think she's noticed me on, on the calls. I've been, I've, been, I've been on different calls with her when she's talking about her book. Um, and one thing that resonated me, with me was she says, the power is with the people. And our election turnout is so dismal. And I think if the people realize that the power is with them, go out and vote. We can make a huge shift and get the government that we want and the government that we deserve. We, you know, this 51, 50, or 49% turnout. No, 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 no. If we, if we realize the power that we have to make a change in this country, the voter turnout will be totally different and it'll be so much higher and we can actually have the country that we need. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I feel like in a sense, you kind of anticipated my next question. Um, so, you know, I, one of the calls to action that I took, even though there were so many, was that we need to do politics differently. And I think you started to answer it right there. But my question for both of you is, you know, A, what are some ways that people can actually start to kind of actively do politics differently? Because it's up to all of us and we all can exercise certain powers, whether we're not, we're on Parliament Hill or not. But then my sub question to that is, who has the power to change the culture in Parliament? So in terms of doing things, she's looking at me, in terms of things to do things differently, what I just said, you know, we need to vote. We need to, we need to uh, provide the information, especially to our young people, which is the largest demographics that we have right now, voting, voting demographic, to go out and educate themselves and vote and not vote uh, for the same old, same old. Don't vote because your mother and your grandmother came here in the 60s and they vote for a particular party. Really educate yourself on exactly what is the party going to do for you, your family, your community, and look at their track record. I'm not saying to, I'm not saying that, you know, to change your vote if you don't need to, but really look at the party and educate yourself as, as voters. We haven't been doing that. I think people have just been voting for the same, you know, the same way uh, uh, for a long time. And that gives those uh, uh, two particular parties power because they know that it's going to be either them or them, and there's you no know, switch back and forth every couple of years, right? So it doesn't give them an incentive to do things better, <laughs> right? There's no incentive to do, do things better. Um, do you so, think, oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, do you think a multi-party system would make things, I mean, yes, we have a multi-party system, but essentially, you know, the pendulum seems to swing back and forth between two to date. Do you think a multi-party system would make this any better or mitigate it? Or what are your thoughts? So my second part was that, you know, we have the, we have several parties and they talk about the diversity and every, you know, every couple of elections, you know, we send out saying, we want you to elect more black people to, uh, to winnable writings. And they say, yes, 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 yes. And then we see the slate and you have maybe two parties will elect maybe, you know, between 10 to 17 people. One party elects one person, the other party just elects their status, you know, puts forth their status quo. I think we have to demand as, a, as, as, as an electorate that we want, to, we want the people who are making laws, we sit at the decision-making table to look like Canada. You know, we don't, yeah. it's, you know, the, our population um, is, is changing. You know, we're changing um, in, in terms of the ethnicity and the culture, but yet our decision-makers look, look the same. That's ridiculous that they look the same. And I think as electors, we need to demand that our political parties change with the times. That's, that's so well said, thank you. Okay, so now I wanna talk about gatekeepers. So, you know, as agents who uphold exclusion, who uphold the status quo, who exercise disciplinary power, how do we recognize them? Like, obviously there's gonna be points at which it's painfully obvious and we'll know it. But those more subtle acts, those, you know, microaggressions, those uh, infrastructural barriers of physical space, all those things. So the question is, with gatekeepers, how do we recognize them? How do we navigate around them or blast through them? And how do we disrupt them? Um, Selena, did you want to, did you want to go first? And then we'll turn to Velma. So, yeah, so... Um... Gatekeepers. I think we're. I think when we focus on the gatekeepers, meaning the people that hold sort of the keys to whether or not we can enter into politics or not, we're focusing on the wrong thing. I think we need to just focus on getting a new gate or changing our strategy around um, getting into politics. So I can use myself as an example. You know, when you usually hear about women running or women of color, it's like, you know, somebody flew across the country to talk to somebody to ask them to be a part of the party. And then they coach them and help them get them in. And then they had all of these things that happened that were part of a central machine. I had none of those. I made a decision. I Googled it and I decided to run. So maybe that was a little serendipitous in my approach because you know I ended up being there. But I think the point is, is that we don't have to go through a gatekeeper. 
we could go, we, we could form, we could actually build a new gate. We have enough people and enough power to do that. So understanding, first of all, that we want to have that civic engagement. And I think if we could ask, talk about this a little bit later, we did talk about how to get people civically minded and engaged a lot earlier than having this conversation now when I'm like mm -hmm. almost 50 years old, right? So you, you, you start those conversations with our young people, the things that Operation Black Vote is doing with 1834 getting them active, getting them to understand the different players that are involved in the political ecosystem and not just the politician. But so if we wanna change the gatekeepers, you have to start building gatekeepers, but that aside. Then start to think about how we get into the gate in a different way, because we know that oftentimes those gatekeepers are going to look past us, look through us, ask us what we're doing here, why are we there, or give us a meet, um, demeaning job that we just, like we're not going to do and we're not going to learn anything from. So how do we do that? Well, organizations like Operation Black Vote are, are doing exactly what we need to do, but we also need to ensure that we're thinking differently in politics. You know, um, when I had political fundraisers, I knew what I didn't want. I didn't want a political fundraiser where we had, you know, cucumber sandwiches with the crust cut off and we had these long, boring speeches. I don't like to do that. I like to fet. So we had fets on boats. We raised, we raised enough money. But I mean, we have to think about what politics is differently. Somebody with a limited imagination or limited imaginations came up with the structure so far. Now we're having a different set of people coming in and we're operating under the same rules. That is not making any sense. How does it make sense to be operating under the same rules with a different influx of people coming through? We have to be thinking differently and not just outside of the box. Like take the box, uh -huh. fold it, like break it down, fold it and put it out at the end of the curb in the recycling bin. Forget about thinking outside the box. We need to be like thinking so outside of, of so innovatively. Yes, that if there we, is no box, right? That there is no box. Yeah. Can I ask you a little bit more about how we build meaningful civic engagement in earlier earlier age? Like, you know, I noticed in the book, like, yes, like your life was political, but perhaps like you weren't channeling your interest there um, in the beginning. So considering the fact that civics is uninteresting for most high schoolers, it has the highest level of, you know, the failure rate in, in uh, high school, you know, like how do we get young people engaged earlier? Well, I mean, everybody has to take civics. So you have to make sure that. So my my 16 year old, now 17 year old, she did civics um, when I was an elected official. And her teacher came to the front of the class and asked everybody to name the MP and MPP and you know the list. And he named someone that was not her mother. Remember that. So how do you expect how do you expect <laughs> students to be engaged when the person at the front of the classroom is not engaged enough to even give the right information. Civics should be a class that's more than just about regurgitating names from your memory of who is the member of parliament, the MPP and the, you know, the mayor. It's more than that. It's a more holistic approach. And I think if people could take a page out of the 1834 book, where you yes. have this comprehensive understanding of, again, the ecosystem of politics and political engagement, that is, that is, Step one. Step two is understanding that what we see, for, for example, in Peel region, when parents were out there activated and demanding that their children were no longer a part of a, a, a racist education system and demanding change within that system, that is democracy. That is our democracy in action. So having people understand that that is also political engagement. It's not just about the guy with the, the cool hair and the nice suit on Parliament Hill. It's about everything yeah. that we do that changes the way our system perpetuates inequity. I agree. And of course, I'd, I'd like to ask the teacher on the call with us. I know you wear many hats. Uh, this is all, this, with all respect due to <laughs> teachers. <laughs> Maybe that guy was the one guy who didn't know who the member for a little bit was. Yeah, you know, Velma, my question is a little two parts. Number one, I want to ask about that engagement piece, but then I also want to come back and ask you uh, to tell everybody a little bit about the 1834 fellowship as well. Okay. So I agree with everything that Selena said. 
I, you know, civics class, I think it is a uh, half credit and it's an elective. Um, in high school, civics should start in elementary school. Mm -hmm. You know, every, I can't remember the, I think we, we do a vote every, for every election, the grade four to grade eight, so they, they do a vote, I can't remember the name of the organization that, um, that do this votes with Elections Canada. But what we need to do is, and what's interesting is at the school that I was at, I was released for the day to basically give an hour presentation to grade four to grade eights about the election and the different players, different players before they, before they did their vote. Um, and then we also re, um, got the, um, M, the MPs from the, the candidates that were running in our, in our riding to come in and speak to the kids. But it needs to start in elementary school. And teachers that are going to be teaching um, this particular course, they need to do PD. You know, the government, um, uh, the boards need to provide PD for teachers who are teaching this course so they teach it properly. Now, is there a reason why the government doesn't want people to know really about civics and civic engagement so it's not in our education? I don't know. But if you really want to have an educated um, uh, population and to increase the vote, then you need to educate people from they are um, in elementary school. What's interesting it, um, is that when we wanted people to start wearing seatbelts, you know what we did? We went into schools and educated the young people. So when they got into the car, they'll tell mom, we got to put our seatbelts on. I remember that. Right? <laughs> it was highly effective. Right. We loved having something to hold over our right. parents. So if you want to, if you want a, a higher voter turnout, you educate the kids because they will go home and tell their parents that we need to go and vote now. Tonight, today's the day we're going to go vote, right? Yeah. Um, so the 1834 Fellowship, um, again, is it's a nine months program um, for youth, black youth, 18 to 25, who have an interest in public policy. Um, they get a mentor. Um, we have mixers, which are basically workshops uh, once a month that we talk about different, um, the, the different um, themes in politics. Um, so we talk about politics and policy. At the end of the, um, the nine months, they have to put together a policy uh, project where they uh, think of um, an issue that's of concern to them and they create a public policy for it. Um, the last cohort did it and they presented it to uh, different people from the sector that they were um, researching and also politicians came to hear their um, their, their, their policy. There's also a conference, an Ottawa conference where uh, they're able to um, engage with different uh, uh, political people in Ottawa, the Senate, uh, the bureaucrats, um, so they get to understand how Ottawa works. But what this really does is provide them with a network, provides them with access, and it provides them with information to empower them. And we tell them in every single, you know, you are a politician. You can be a politician, you can be a policymaker. So we try to, you know, give them a good dose of self-confidence that they could go into these, these roles because they have the education, they have the skills, and they have the lived experience to be great policymakers. I appreciate that. I think people being actually, you know, being comfortable in those otherwise very intimidating spaces that perhaps they've never been in before is a huge part. It's a huge part of this. So uh, we're, you know, soon we have to go to the question period. I can't believe how quickly everything is going by because I, I have so much more that I want to ask, but I think we'll do one more question. Um, so, you know, as we've discussed, there's no clear roadmap to entering political life. A lot of this happens by, you know, if we're going to look at the status quo, it's by tipping people into opportunity or, you know, your well-built up networks or things like that. But how do we, for, for those of the people on the call who want to learn about, like, what are the actual jobs? How do I get started? How do we create inclusive pipelines for talent, diverse talent, to better understand what an actual career may look like, learn those entry points, and tap into existing opportunities? Well, that's what Operation Blackboard does. <laughs> yes. Right? Uh, we, have, we have workshops throughout the year just to talk about different um, um different ways, different entry points, different access points. Um, so whether you're going to get the nomination for a particular party, whether you're going to be running municipally, uh, whether you're going to be running for trustees. I mean, trustee, the trustee role is one of those roles that's hidden, right? And that's why we yes. get these, these, these fools being trustees and saying these racist things because no one's, no one's paying attention to their race, to, 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 to their uh, trustee race. You know, everyone's paying attention to the councillor race and to the mayor race. Um, so we provide 
um, information on access points. We provide um, information and uh, or connections to different people in terms of, you know, we want to meet this person, you know, chances are we know somebody who can get them a meeting with, with somebody. Um, we provide them with a network. Um, of how to do that. And if we don't know, I mean, we, we partner with different organizations. Um, they're doing like-minded things that we can provide them access to as well. Great, thank you so much. And Selena, I wanna kind of pivot the question a little bit to, to ask you if, if you know any resources, and I'm sure that these are built into uh, Operation Black Boat Canada's resources, but I wanna talk a little bit more about your latest book, Maximizing You. And like, I haven't read it yet, but I've ordered it, which is exciting. But you know, are, is resilience part of this training process? Is perseverance? Like what really struck me about your book was just how many times you fell down and how many times you really kept getting back up and saying, you know, and saying like my failures are, are becoming my strengths. And how do people develop that confidence, that perseverance and that resilience, especially, you know, getting there is one thing, but surviving it is another. And then we'll turn to the questions. Yeah, so I did write the, the workbook that goes with Can You Hear Me Now called Maximizing You. And I, I, I wrote it from the perspective of understanding that as an entrepreneur who ran a healthcare-based research management firm for 10 years, I learned all these lessons about mistakes, about resilience, about overcoming fear and imposter syndrome and how to network and do all this and how to get out of your comfort zone. And then when I got into politics, I was like, oh my God, I'm using all these lessons again. And I've been using all these lessons all my life. So I wrote a book on it because um, again, why was I learning the lessons at like 45 years old? I kept thinking, why didn't somebody just tell me this a long time ago? And I could have avoided a lot of tragedy. So um, the book Maximizing You really is not, it's not a political book um, any more than Can You Hear Me Now is a political book necessarily. It is in some aspects, but it's about life. It's about whether you're getting into politics or you're getting into business or you're getting into a new school or a new job, you have to learn certain things that allow people to navigate through this country quite successfully. And if you don't have those kinds of mechanisms, those levers of, you know, networks and connections and how to build them and what circles to form and how to overcome fear, you're, you're, you're going to have a really hard time navigating through them. And so I just thought, yeah, might as well write a book on that too. Thank you. Well, you know, I think we'll have to have you back another time to talk about the book. But in the meantime, um, some amazing questions are coming in through the chat. So I'd like to, you know, open that up. But I also want to say that in about a minute or so, maybe in between questions, we're also going to run a trivia question. And uh, for all of those on the call with us, uh, you know, please stay on because we're going to, uh, we're going to give you a chance to win, to win Selena's book. But first, uh, we have a question from Sabrina at the Samara Center for Democracy. And Selena, I saw you congratulate her on her new role. And I also mm -hmm. want to say, uh, we don't know each other yet, Sabrina, but we will soon. And I want to say congratulations to you as well on behalf of everyone here. Uh, the question is, we know that so-called diversity hires are generally exceptional. And when they shine too brightly, the old guard gets insecure and mobilizes against progress. What a great question. How do we turn overturn this commitment to mediocrity? <laughs> We'd like what to a, take that one. <laughs> what a fantastic question. Well, yeah. That's like the role of the model minority, right? So you have a choice to make at that point. Do you, do you dim your light in order to accommodate someone's in a, inadequacies with themselves? Or do you continue to shine brightly and possibly disrupt? Again, it depends on the culture of the organization. If, if the culture of the organization understands that that ability to shine brightly is going to create value and therefore is an asset to an organization. And if we look at work done by McKinsey and company talking about racial inequality in the United States costing them 6% of their GDP or one to $1.5 trillion by 2028, we have to think to ourselves, if, if inequality is gonna cost an, an whole economy, what's it gonna cost us? What's it going to cost our organization? What's it going to cost our company? So when that light is shining bright, if the organization realizes that that is a value add and therefore is an asset, it will, it will work to let that light shine brightly. If the culture of the organization doesn't because it's holding power, privilege, and profit too tightly in its little hand, then that's why really great people leave mediocre organizations. I think that's really well said. Um, so let's go to the second question. 
So question two is a combination of several questions about Green Party leader and Amy Paul, who's facing a no confidence motion from the Green Party Council. So what are both of your thoughts on representation and power as it relates to someone like an Amy? Thelma, did you want to maybe go first? Well, you know, I think, and I, and I tweeted at this, that, you know, everyone is into inclusion and everyone's an ally until you have to report to a Black woman. Hmm. That's all I'm saying. Oh my God, I think I need a drink after that. <laughs> I know. I feel mean, like that was a bit, that was a microphone drop moment, like where. Yo. Yeah. I'm going to tweet that. Did anybody record this? I'm going to have to like. This is that. totally being recorded. Yeah. Lena, did you want to add anything or does that really say it all? I'm not really sure there's anything you could add to that. That's yeah, I agree. That's a total microphone phone drop moment. Yeah. Um, so That's I think- my you know, breath away, but I need yeah. a moment. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think, um, why don't we do the trivia question now? And then that way we can get a little bit of audience engagement and then come back for a couple more questions. So for our audience, since its inception in 1867, the House of Commons so, uh, sorry, has I, had, I, mean, uh, oh. I just want to let people know because they're going to win this. Uh, they're going to win this prize. This is a, this is a serious prize. A signed copy of the book. It's going to be the first person to answer this correctly in the chat, right? So you have to be prepared quickly on the chat to answer this question. Whoever gets the first um, is gets this right first uh, and, but wins the prize. And if no one, I mean, I believe we're going to get this right answer, but are, are we going to go well, for we, the close? If they get close, we, we might, we, yeah. we'll, we'll, like if it takes a little while, you know, it's not, it's a, it's a challenging trivia question. Velma can't play uh, because I think she <laughs> might already know the answer, but, but okay. anyone else is, it? yeah. So get your, your keyboards ready. So here's the question. Since its inception in 1867, the House of Commons has had exactly 4,086 members of parliament. Of those 4,086, how many MPs, current and past, have identified themselves as black members of parliament? So get your answer in the chat and, and let's see what we come up with. Okay, we're seeing some good guesses here, but we're not quite there yet. Keep guessing. Selena and oh, Velma, do you on. know the answer? I like people's optimism with those high numbers. Yeah. 105, 105 killed me. 105, like that is like, what? <laughs> that uh, is awesome. I like, I like people are optimistic. We got someone get real close, so. Yeah, what do you think, John? Do you keep going or do we're we within announce? one? Uh, yeah. we'll get, get, give them, let's give people 30 more seconds. Can I, can okay. I, while, while we, while we give 30 more seconds, I, I just want to say something about anime fall. Um, and, and, and not specifically to that, but if every time a, a party had an issue with its leader, you changed over that leader, we got a winner. You never okay. have a leader, right? Yeah. We, so, we got a winner here. Oh. But Selena, so, we'll come back to you so you can say your, yeah, so, your piece. So we got, um, so we have uh, M's iPad uh, with the correct answer of, se of 17. Um, out of 4,000, how many, Victoria? 4,000? 86. Something? 86, 17. I, 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 I'm like Selena, I'm a bit of a nerd, a math nerd. Um, and so I did the math. That's 0.4% of all members of parliament in our, in our history. Um, and, and, to, and to say, you know, we are one of the, the, the four founding people of this country. Mm -hmm. 100, in, in 153 years. The data of, staggering. Of the, democracy, of the democracy, establishment, of the, yes. Of but way before that. Way, yeah. We were yeah. way before, yeah. yeah. So I want to say congratulations to M. But what I want to say more is look at that data and you know don't second guess yourself. You know get in touch with the with Velma at Operation Black Folk Canada. Get in touch with you know mentors or people you've heard speak and embolden yourself because 
you know, Canada deserves and we have to carve out that diverse representation. Selena, I know that there was a comment that you wanted to say. Um, can we go back to you for a second? And then I'm gonna to try to get through these three additional questions. No, go through the questions. I, 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 I finished my point. I just, I was just talking about party politics when it comes to turnover. Like it, it just, it's not a sustainable model. But go ahead. Thank you. So number, question number three is a combination of a couple questions as well. For Velma and Selena, can you please share advice for black women who'd like to get into politics? And as a woman of color, I'm conscious, oh, sorry. And as a woman of color, I am conscious of how my health has been affected. Um, sorry, my chat just, Ashley, can you help me read number three? My chat just froze completely. I apologize. Um, so for both Velma and Selena, can you please both share advice for a black woman who would like to get into politics? And as a woman of color, I'm conscious of how my health has been affected by racism and other factors. How can one run for office while engaging in adequate self-care? Excellent question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just use Selena's words because I've heard her speak so many times. Uh, she talked about running in packs. Yeah. And you have to run in packs. I think you, you need to have that network. And I think your pack doesn't only have to be Black women, right? Your pack could be people who are going to be disturbers with you, who's going to have your back. And you know who those people are, right? And I think, you know, critical mass is 30%. You need to have people around you. You, you, need, you need to run in packs. And you need to also know when you're going to say, okay, I've had enough. I'm going to step back today, or I'm going to step back for a couple of days. You really need to give yourself permission to take a break. You're mm -hmm. not stopping, right? Mm -hmm. you're continuing, but you're going to take a break so you could take care of yourself. Because if you can't take, if you're not, if you're not healthy, you won't be able to take care of anybody else, right? So I think. Be going into the role con with a conscious mind saying that you're going to have to, you're going into this war zone, right? You have to arm up, you know? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a soldier, you're going into war, you have all the tools that you need. You have to have those, those tools. But one of those tools has to be mental, right? You have to have that mental um, toughness to say, I'm going into this, but I'm also going to give myself a break to say, okay, I need to, I need to relax right now and then I'll continue on. Okay, I think we probably have, thank you so much for that, Mama. No, Velma. I want to hear Selena, I want to hear Selena's answer oh, to this. Oh, no, that was good, Velma, you got, you got everything. Um, I, I, that's it, run in packs, and only you could burn yourself out, so you need to. I think that's true, pause. but recognizing when those moments of self-care were needed. Sure. Um, okay, so I just quickly, if I can just get your thoughts, this is from Juliana on the term BIPOC. How can we make sure that we're not all grouped together and that our history and differences are actually acknowledged? Be intentional about, about saying the words that you want to say. When I talk about diversity, equity, inclusion being a multi-billion dollar industry that didn't affect not BIPOC people, but Black and Indigenous, I'm very intentional with the words that I use because they have impact and lumping everybody together Please do not read that Globe and Mail article and think that 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 is not why we use don't use the word BIPOC because that was nonsense. What we need to do is be intentional about our words because they do matter, and those two groups tend to be the ones that are least beneficial of some of the advances that we've made in terms of equity. That's very well said. You know, for our audience, remember always that words are living powers, and and that we can employ them. Um, so I want to say thank you so much for the time today. It went by so quickly and I just want to leave everybody with a call to action that uh, John and the Exchange are offering an introductory workshop next week for anyone interested in uh, nonpartisan engagement and, and training opportunities in the upcoming fall election. It's next Thursday, June 24th. Uh, they'll be sharing the link to register. And, you know, I want to give my heartfelt thanks to you, Selena and Velma, uh, for sharing everything you did with us today. We all learned so much, and I think we're all emboldened for it, uh, for your time and for your generosity of spirit as well. And I want to thank our guests for giving us their time. Uh, huge thank you on behalf of the exchange. And, you know, we'll see you at the next session. Thank you so much and have a great day.